So this is a meeting of the um, Jijang Bosal Book Club. We're meeting on August 8th, and we are continuing our discussion of, let me share my screen now so that uh, you can see what we are discussing. We're continuing our discussion of this book, uh, Jiru Ng's uh, The Making of a Savior of Bodhisattva. Um, and uh, and this, this week we'll be discussing chapter one. I mean, this month or this, uh, yeah, tonight we'll be discussing chapter one and we'll begin with um, uh, chanting uh, the Jijang Bozal chant. Sorry, I just want to make sure I did I set the sharing up correct so that the sound gets shared. Sometimes I forget to do that. Jangbo sai ji jangbo sai ji jangbo sai ji jangbo sai ji 
about we, we so we already talked about the introduction which is the in, in the, the first chapter of the book but it's not chapter one chapter one comes after the introduction so that's what we're going to be talking about tonight um, anybody have anything you want to bring up or or uh, topics you want to focus on or questions you want to ask or things you want to bring up from previous discussions <clears throat> anything at all would be is yeah Joe Hey, I just wanted to say after having read that this afternoon, uh -huh. um, it really made sense. Uh, I think it was your past two uh, Tuesdays you had spoke about the various um, um, what dynasties, what have you, in China mm -hmm. and the split between the North and the South. So all of that was was really great prep work for me to have heard that from you. To, to then go in and read this chapter and it all, all made sense. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, and uh, yeah, and I have to admit, so I'm, I'm kind of a, a history uh, geek. And so I, 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 it's hard for me to calibrate what is beyond the tolerance, tolerance of other people when it comes to going on and on and on about history. But I think in this case, I, I, I feel justified, but the, and thank you for validating me, Joe. I always love to be validated. I, I'll, there, I'll admit it. Um, okay, so I'm going to share my screen now again. And so here's that book that we are talking about. 
and over here you can see uh, is the table of contents and just to get us you know make sure that we're kind of all you know literally on the same pages um, so we talked about the introduction um, last time problems and perspectives we actually spent um, two meetings discussing that we're going to spend two meetings on uh, the first chapter but the first chapter is uh, the f is both the first chapter of part one which is early images the bodhisattva in this defiled world and uh, it's the first chapter of part one it's also the chapter one of the book itself um, although the the introduction uh, is a substance substantive chapter in and of itself. Um, so I have prepared some slides and for reasons that will hopefully become uh, clear, I'm calling this presentation, Do Not Blame the Dragons. Okay, we will talk some about dragons um, this time. And uh, because it's, uh, dragons are another thing that I have a weakness for. Um, let's see, here we are. Now, uh, let me just get this set up properly. All right, in the introduction, uh, Ng, Jiru Ng, uh, told us that part one here, introduces and analyzes the early manifestations of Dizong in China from the 6th to 8th, 8th centuries. Okay, so in the in the full book, she's going to go up as far as the 10th century, but in the in the in part one, she's focusing just on the 6th to 8th centuries. Uh, based on early scriptural representations of Dizong in the scripture on the 10 wheels and uh, the uh, section of the Sumeru treasury. We're going to talk about both of these scriptures more and how to, you know, their titles and uh, translations, which there aren't. But anyway, we're, we're going to talk about that. But this is what she already told us in, in the introduction, um, that uh, she's going to focus on scriptural, early scriptural representations of Dizong in China, in Chinese. And uh, the scripture on the 10 wheels inspired the basis for early cultic beginnings, including links to Sanjay Zhao. Now, Sanjay Zhao, she's going to talk, this is a movement, um, a, uh, yeah, in Chinese Buddhism that she will talk more about in chapter two. Um, in this early phase of the Dizan cult, the Chinese religious imagination was already at work crafting the identity and history of the Bodhisattva, particularly in response to the socio-political conditions of 5th and 6th century China, the scripture on the 10 wheels inspired innovative visual imagery, including the Shanji representation of Dizong as a Buddha surrounded by the six paths of rebirth. Now, that is where the... cover of the book comes from. That's what she's, this is the Shanji um, representation of Dizong, surrounded by the six paths of rebirth. Now, if uh, I think she has a figure somewhere in the book, when we'll get to it, um, showing the original of this. This is kind of an artist stared closely at this um, engraving. Uh, I think it's an engraving and kind of then imaginatively kind of you know it's 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 a it's not that clear and even in this picture this is much clearer than the actual engraving that it, that it is um inspired by uh but i can't tell so here's it there's the six worlds one two three four five six this is the buddha here this is a uh, dizong and uh, these are some attendants of Dizong. I think she might identify them. I, I'm not sure which of these is the hell realm, which of these is the hungry ghost realm, which of these is, you know, the, anyway. But this is the image that she's talking about in, in that section of the um, introduction. Now, let me go back into the, um, here we go. And I do like that picture. It's a cool picture. Um, and I wish I could identify which is which in terms of which which of the 
parts of the image represent uh, which of the realms. Now, so part one is divided into two chapters, and this class, um, which is happening on August 8th, and the next one in two weeks on August 22nd, we will focus on the first chapter um, uh, of the book, which is also the first chapter of part one, Early Scriptural Representation, Texts and Context, which is pages 29 to 49. Uh, and chapter one specifically focuses a lot on the Sutra on the Ten Wheels, also known as the Dasa Chakra Sutra in Sanskrit, or the whatever this is. This is ship. Oh, yeah, I did work this out. Um, Bun Gyeong, Ship Bun Gyeong in, in the Chinese, in the Sino Korean pronunciation, and the se section on the Sumeru Treasury. And I'm actually going to look a little bit more at these, these titles and, and so that we can identify them. The titles of sutras, especially ones that are not. Uh, ones that we encounter very often can be very confusing. They often have the same words in them. Uh, there's a, there's another sutra that is closely related to um, Dizang that is called the Sutra of the Ten Kings, which is different from the Sutra of the Ten Wheels. Um, useful English language materials on these two texts in particular, including especially English translations, are a bit elusive. This is kind of an understatement here. Uh, Jiru Ng does provide some of her own translations um, in uh, for parts of these texts, but not a lot. Um, but it's a good starting point. Okay. So speaking of which, I put together a list of things. And so uh, th th tonight's class, and when we meet again in two weeks, we'll still be covering um, this first chapter, and I really encourage people to read these first two links here, and I will go over this a little bit. This provides a summary of the Sutra of the Ten Wheels uh, in English. <laughs> I have to specify that. Um, uh, summaries in Korean or Japanese or Chinese are not particularly helpful to me, although I have found some. Um, this is another um, uh, English language. Um, oh, wait a minute. Uh, oh, wait, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. These are two other talks that are also about the Sutra on the Ten Wheels. But these two talks are specifically about um, uh, uh, the focus on meditation, meditation practice uh, in the Sutra on the Ten Wheels. And there's actually some discussion. Um, in, in in these two articles here, which are which are also quite good, uh, contrasting the way that um, the sutra on the ten wheels actually does have much more of a focus on the practice of meditation uh, than the Kshitigarbha Sutra itself has. The Kshitigarbha Sutra, which we've already read, right, uh, does talk a lot about various practices that one can do, um, but these are often not necessarily meditation practices or not. In a, you know, anything could be a meditation practice um, uh, from from a Zen perspective, as long as while you are doing it, you're asking who is doing this practice, but they're not explicitly um, presented as meditation practices, whereas in the Sutra on the Ten Wheels, they specifically talk about Chan and Samadhi and practice and how and what actually it's it's not so much how to do it. It's the things that you have to avoid um, in order to avoid obstacles in med anyway. And hopefully I'll get a chance to talk some more about this. Um, this is another article uh, in English, which has some very um, uh, from and these are all all of these things here are from uh, Chinese uh, teachers who uh, speaking who also can speak and write in English um, and uh, providing some information on the Sutra on the Ten Wheels. Uh, that, here, uh, so the Sutra on the Ten Wheels, well, Kshitigarbha in general, and the Sutra on the Ten Wheels in, in particular, is also important in a modern practice of Tibetan Buddhism. So up here, this is all how uh, Kshitigarbha and the Sutra on the Ten Wheels are seen in the eyes of modern day Chinese Buddhists who in, in these particular cases happen to speak and be able to write in English. Hallelujah. As far as <laughs> this what I say, when I can, when I find, you know, contemporary uh, Asian um, uh, Buddhists of, of, of any school uh, who can write uh, in, in, in English, I'm always very, very grateful for that, that they've taken the time and the trouble um, 
uh, it's a it's a wonderful um, wonderful good fortune to find that. Now, in uh, Tibetan Buddhism, also in contemporary uh, Tibetan Buddhism, Chittigarbha is important, and the Sutra on the Ten Wheels is also uh, important. These are two. Um, uh, texts from uh, Mipam Rinpoche, who um, he's been dead for a little over 100 years, but he's extremely influential in contemporary um, Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, and these are actually two fairly short um, texts uh, by him on um, Chittigarbha. And uh, this first one in particular is uh, largely based on the Sutra on the Ten Wheels. Um, now, in addition, <clears throat> it turns out that even though the Sutra on the Ten Wheels has uh, not been <laughs> translated into English, someone a thousand years ago or more went to the trouble of engraving the entire thing on a cave wall. Um, <laughs> in fact, they did it twice. Um, and uh, as, as we'll discuss momentarily, there are actually two um, extant Chinese versions, and um, one of them uh, one of them is engraved on a, so this is a book on um uh things that you can find written on cave walls in china <laughs> basically <laughs> it doesn't contain the the actual texts themselves but it contains you know what you can find where it has lots of pictures it's basically a catalog a a a, a catalog with um lots of photographs um and uh and here, there is a whole website on stone sutras, stone sutras. I mean, there's, this is such a pro, uh, prevalent phenomenon in, in the history of Chinese Buddhism that they even have a word for it, stone sutras. Um, and this is a whole uh, book on stone sutras, and it has the um, the two versions. So the, for wherever you see the number four, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in a minute. Um, this 411 refers to the full, um, oh, this is the, uh, ch -ch 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 oh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, as it says right here, excerpt on meditation, okay, so this is excerpt on meditation is from the uh, one version of the um, Sutra on the Ten Wheels, and the other version, which is actually a shorter version, the entire sutra has been engraved uh, on on the wall of a cave somewhere, approximately 50,000 characters. Um, and you can see pictures of part of it in, in, in uh, if you go to these, um, uh, as there, there, there are a series of books being published by uh, Brill in this series on stone sutras. Each one of those books is like 150 bucks or more. And I do not believe that they actually contain uh, English translations, or let alone the full uh, Chinese text of, of the things. It's like I said, it's a heavily illustrated catalog, but it's still very nice. Okay. All right. So this slide, any, any uh, questions so far? Um, and this is kind of, uh, I'm trying to provide some, you know, background. So, so one of the problems with this chapter and with this book is that it relies heavily on some texts that we don't have access to <laughs> directly. Um, and it, it, you know, to tell the, uh, the story of the history of Dizong in China, you have to tell the story of the Sutra on the Ten Wheels. Um, and, and in fact, to tell the story of uh, uh, practices and beliefs and ideas associated with Dizong in contemporary Chinese Buddhism, you also have to tell the story of the Sutra on the Ten Wheels, which has not been translated into English. But it's really fortunate that, um, like I, I showed previously right here, these two links up here provide a very detailed uh, summary of the, for example, if you read, uh, you know, and I, I mean, I'm, I, I'm really appreciative of Zhu Ying writing this, this only really uh, full book length study of uh, uh, Dizong uh, in the English language, but she writes a chapter that's largely devoted to the 10 wheels, to the sutra on the 10 wheels. She never really describes what these 10 wheels are. <laughs> what, what are these 10 wheels? What wheels? What do you mean wheels? I mean, what, what are they? And, and this summary provides um, uh, 
a, a good, you, you know what the 10 wheels are after you read the summary. Um, going too far. Okay. All right. So, um, in order to keep straight, what's what, you know, who's on first and so forth, um, you kind of have to uh, look at both. Uh, and she usually provides both the uh, uh, Romanized and in Chinese characters, the Chinese title for the sutra, as well as a, the Sanskrit title of the sutra, and then usually a, a translation into English. So we have the sutra on the 10 wheels, which is, oh yeah, so I do have it here. Okay, Sutra on the Ten Wheels, which in uh, this is this is kind of the characters a little bit bigger. This means ten, right? This means um, uh, wheel, <laughs> and this means sutra. Okay, Ship Yun Gyeong uh, in Sino Korean, Ten Wheels Sutra. That's pretty straightforward. <laughs> uh, the other primary text that, that uh, Zhu Ying talks about in this chapter is the Sumeru Treasury section, which is already a little strange. Why is it a section? Just like in the Ten Wheels, what are these wheels? What is it a section of? Well, it's, it's, so it's a section of a much longer sutra. Um, and so the Sumeru Treasury section, this is, these two characters right here are Su Mi. All right, and this character right here is kind of this is the me in Amita Bull in in Sino Korean. When you chant Amita Bull, this is this second character here is the me. This is a character. Um, these two characters together, Sumi. This is the Chinese name of Sumeru Mountain, Sumi. This character here, uh, this is the Jang in Ji Jang Bosal. This is the character that means treasury, or it's the Sanskrit word Garba. Okay which means all kinds of weird things, storehouse, treasury, womb, matrix. And this is a, this is a very common uh, uh, Chinese word uh, uh, pronounced in Sino Korean as bun. It means part of, something that is a part of something else. So you, you can say this is a section, this is a division, this is a part, this is a chapter, uh, whatever. So uh, she just calls it the section on the Sumeru treasury. Um, and, uh, oh yeah, she also mentions this other, this is kind of a, 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 the Humane King Sutra, uh, in Wang Gyeong, uh, which is also, this is Humane, this is King, this is Sutra. Um, uh, so it, you have to be careful. Um, like I said, there's another Sutra completely different called the Ten Kings Sutra. Um, uh, there is a, uh, uh, and often there are multiple versions of these, you know, there, one of the, another text that she refers to in this chapter is the, um, I can't even remember what it is. It has the, it has the word flower in its title. And I, we, there is a later slide on it. Um, but you have to be careful with, um, uh, sutras that have either the word flower or the word lotus in their, in their title. There's a bunch of them. Um, <laughs> and they're not all the same. In fact, okay. Camille. I see that you raised your hand. I couldn't see if you... I have a question. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. How about the section on the Sumeru treasury? Yeah. It's, it's, it kind of takes um, an excerpt of it, like describing an event. Um, but mm -hmm. it seems like it's basically like requisites of livelihood according to their necessities. And then those things that like I would think of as necessities, like like yes. food, clothing, bedding. Mm -hmm. um, but then she goes into like necessities and ornaments. <laughs> and those do not seem like. Am I missing some context? No, no, no. But uh, that that, so, crazy. yeah, I, I don't know. Um, necklaces show up um, in 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 these kinds of things. That um, it it is something that just kind of pops up every once in a while in the Chittigarbha Sutra itself. As um, it can be things that people need that are provided, you know, so, the, so on the one hand, uh, you know, these are things that well, the other things are, appear pretty more obviously as um, uh, necessities. Um, but, you know, I guess uh, the necessities don't just necessarily stop at the bare necessities. I, I yeah, yeah. So I, I can't answer the question because I have the same basic Huh? When I see the necklaces thrown in there along with like food and water, food, water, necklaces, Joe. Yeah. I mean, no, I, 
I found that interesting, but then I, my mind went to some of these um, Chinese uh, sculptures of uh, Quan Yin and so forth, and as they're sitting there in their royal ease posture, they're usually draped in all kinds of beads around the, the neck, the breast, the arms, the wrists, <laughs> and I'm like, it's a way of life. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And, and these are things that are, that are to be provided to us, um, you know, if we are good Buddhists. You know, I don't, I don't want to be too um, glib about it, um, but these are nice things to have, I guess. Not just um, necessity, bare necessities anyway. Ah. So, um, oh, so one thing, so if you, as you go through and you try to figure out, you know, one of the things that isn't always completely clear is like, well, maybe there is an English translation of these things somewhere that I just don't know about. That's kind of, you know, obscure or in some old book that hasn't been reprinted or something. And eh, it turns out, no, the, so the, the very nice summaries that I managed to find in the links that I showed on that previous slide, those only were, uh, came out in last year. Um, and so when Jiru Ng published this book, um uh well I, f I forget what the publication date on the book is it's been a while i think it's 2015 maybe maybe even before that um but i mean this is a it is an important reminder of how young and i would say immature um the state of buddhism is still in, in the west um and yeah I could say more about that, but I mean that that is a that is a very important um, issue. Um, that there are a lot of important uh, uh, Buddhist texts, teachings that we just do not have access to, unless you know Chinese or Tibetan or Pali or Sanskrit, um, or you know. And as soon as soon as you say that to someone who's a real Buddhist scholar, they'll say, well you know, at least one, but preferably two or three of those, you know, and maybe throw in some Gandhari and, you know, and Mongolian. Uh, Mongolian is good. Um, yeah. Anyway, so, uh, uh, all right. It, it is um, uh, right about time to take a break. Uh, so I do, I do, I do want to take a, a five minute break. Um, and then uh, come back and pick up with this. I do want to talk more about C beta and how to uh, look up Chinese Buddhist stuff on the internet. Okay, um, but I do I do say here everything you ever or never wanted to know about looking up Chinese Buddhist stuff on the internet, but we're afraid to ask because it's all it's quite likely uh, not everybody really wants to do that. But I think uh, when you're when you're dealing with sutras that uh, may or may not have any translation or anything, when you're dealing with these particular kinds of texts, you have to at least um, skim the surface of of um, knowing a little bit about C beta and what what the uh, what Taisho means and things like that. We will talk about that uh, after the break. Okay, so we'll take a five minute break and uh, see ya in five minutes.
Okay. So now we're starting again. All right. From this slide. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. So, any uh, any questions or anything? Anybody want to ask? Before I plug away at this. All right. So, if you are, um, yeah. So the English translations of these sutras are not available anywhere. But if you read Chinese, um, and 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 actually, I I I, I say that kind of joking. But I'm gonna I'm going to uh, get out of presentation mode because when you have if you if you have these slides um, you can in fact um, click on these links and uh, when it comes up if you're lucky I can never so you, you see my screen now you see the web pages come up you see how up here it says oh you can have it in Chinese or you can have it in English sometimes. You will, you will, I, I think, I think Google is doing this. I'm not sure. I, I, sh I should know. As an, as a retired IT professional, I know, I should know what the functionality is behind this. But, so I've, I've selected English. And so now all of a sudden I'm seeing things in English. Here. Not, so, but the, the, this is automatically generated English translation. This is not really a good English translation, um, but it is a lot better than nothing. Um, and so uh, even though the only thing that's available is the, um, <laughs> even says here, mistran so this is almost certainly a mistranslation where it says here that this is a mistranslation. It's a translation um anyway so if you go you, you have to select the volume of the there were so we are now looking at the 10 the the sutra on the 10 wheels online it's free it's in chinese and uh and you can get an automatically generated translation into english of it um which is again better than nothing uh but i mean for example it starts off with so i smell okay this is uh, supposed to be, thus have I heard. Um, <laughs> anyway, so it it is, in fact, a lot better than nothing. There are um, some things you can do. If I have time, I'll show an example of how you can kind of, if you if you spend a little time uh, and, are, and are determined, you can actually extract information uh, from the um, from the online versions of these sutras, uh, even if you don't know much Chinese. But if you know a little little bit, uh, you can you can um, uh, be dangerous, uh, as they say. You can have a little knowledge, and you can be very dangerous. Okay, but so here is uh, on these links show uh, where you can find the Chinese for both of the versions of uh, the sutra and the ten wheels that um Zhuring refers to uh this is where this is a link where you can find the online uh chinese uh a version uh, of the sumeru treasury uh sec section on the sumeru treasury and just uh you know for completeness this is where you can find the uh chinese text of the Kshitigarbha sutra as well um these texts are all uh, online as part of something that's called the Chinese Buddhist Electronic Text Association, and um, uh, they uh, organize the uh, entire uh, Tripitaka. Right, Tripitaka is the three baskets of Buddhism. These are the um, the Vinaya, the Sutras, and the Abhidharma, and <clears throat> and uh, the entire uh, Chinese Buddhist Tripitaka is online, uh, thanks to uh, this group that now is now called the Chinese Buddhist Electronic Chinese Buddhism Electronic Text Association. Now uh, they organize the text that they have online according to the organization that's found in something that's called the Taisho Collection. <laughs> so who here has heard this term before, Taisho 
Taisho collection. Okay, if you look at the footnotes in Jiro Ng's books, um, and in, in her book, it refers to the Taisho collection with a capital T. And I, I will, um, oh yeah, down here, uh, for example, see down here, in the footnote number 68 on page 47, <laughs> Jiro Ng refers to T245 colon 8 dot 833b when citing a section from the Humane King Sutra. Um, so this tells us that uh, the Ren Wan Jing, which is the Humane King Sutra, is volume eight. That's what the number after the colon in her in her way of doing it is. And number 245. Um, <clears throat> and you have to do a little bit more. So this, uh, 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 if anybody has questions on this, please ask me. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on this, although I've spent a lot of time on it. Okay, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time. I'm going to I'm going to have you share my pain a little bit. Um, but what these numbers mean? T. This is the more normal way that you'll see it. Often, when 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 people put footnotes, they use a slightly different um, way of arranging the numbers. But T13. This is what you see in the actual. URL, the actual web address that you're going to, has this code in it. T13N0411 means Taisho Collection, Volume 13, Number 411, uh, which is also sometimes written as T4411, colon 13, which is how Zhuring and many, many scholars will write it in when they're, when they're given the citation in their works. Um, <clears throat> And this is enough information here for you to translate a, um, a footnote or citation in a scholarly article into a workable um, web address for you to go look it up yourself. And then when it appears on your web browser, you can click on that English button and then look at the funny um, things that the uh, automatic translation does with the Chinese. But if you're looking for something about dragons, usually the translation will get it right. And so you will be able to, if you're, if you, if you have a section of a sutra that has not been translated into English, or maybe it has been translated into English, and you think the translation might be a little screwy, you say, what are these dragons doing in here? You can go and you can go look it up. I might be able to give an example of that later on. Um, but what is the Taisho collection? Taisho collection is the entire um, uh, Tripitaka in Chinese. It's actually put together by Japanese scholars under Emperor Taisho, <laughs> who ruled uh, from uh, 1912 to 1926. Um, they were Japanese scholars, but they didn't. It's not a Japanese uh, Tripitaka. It's a Chinese Tripitaka, but it's actually a version of the Chinese Tripitaka that comes from Korea. Um, it's the Tripitaka Koreana is the most complete version of uh, Buddhist uh, of the entire the entirety of the Buddhist teachings uh, in Chinese. It comes from Korea. Uh, it was um, uh, carved wooden blocks uh, beginning in the Tang Dynasty, but then they they anyway so. It's, I think it's a little interesting, but it's, uh, 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 that's where basically all of the, all the sutras that we have that are translated from Chinese are, come from, uh, these texts, um, they were put together by Japanese scholars using Korean, cool. well, they weren't using the Korean wood blocks, but they did have the, uh, print, printing, prints that were made from the Korean wood blocks. Um, anyway, all right, so let's go back to my slideshow mode. All right, I think that's enough on that. Anybody have any questions on the Chinese Buddhist <laughs> Electronic Text Association? There, I've become good friends with them recently. Okay, all right. So, did I, I said something about dragons, right? All right. So, in um, 
Okay, so this is from Azure Inc.'s book on pages 45 through 46, and then also on 47. Um, this is where she's talking about uh, the political situation in China in the 5th and 6th centuries. And one of the things that she's emphasizing is the fact that there was a tendency in China for the state to want to regulate the temples and the monasteries. Um, and and to tax them as well. And there was pushback from that uh, by the Buddhists. Um, and one of the things that that they that uh, the Buddhists emphasized is the, the the inherent sacredness of the monastics of monks and nuns, um, up to and including just how sacred their robes were. All right. So this is a quote from uh, oh yeah, <laughs> this is a quote from the Chandra Garba Sutra, um, uh, emphasizing this point. Uh, Moreover, the, this Kasaya robe is protected by all the Buddhas for this reason, Bhagavan. Should a cruel Kshatriya king destroy the Dharma, vex monks and nuns, including those fitted or unfitted to the task? This is kind of an important point that keeps bringing. It's kind of like the necklaces. Um, <clears throat> this kind of sticks out a little bit. Uh, this is specifically saying that it is not correct for the government to um, punish or or really uh, stick their nose in, into the business of uh, Buddhist institutions um, deciding which monks and which nuns are following the rules properly and which aren't. Um, so monks and nuns including those fitted or unfitted for the task who have followed the Buddha and renounced the lay life. If he should regulate and punish their bodies, tax their properties, dare even to take away their lives. For these reasons, the Devas, Yakshas, Asuras, Kumbandas, I can never remember what the Kumbandas are. Um, anyway, in that country will give rise to a wrathful mind toward all that belong to the Kshatriya king and will cause to arise in his country disputes, the peril of famine, epidemics, uh, all these bad things. This is not the fault of the dragons. Very important. <laughs> this is not the fault of the dragons. So what, what it's saying is that um, uh, these various dragons are themselves actually not guilty, but they unfortunately have acquired a bad reputation. So what's happening here, what Zero Ing is using this and, and similar things to focus on kind of a political point that she's making, um, that the situation that Buddhism faced in China was different from what it had faced in India and Central Asia, where there hadn't been this tendency um, for uh, the government to try to regulate and even tax and even, you know, punish and arrest uh, monastics uh, and priests uh, and nuns. Um, at the same time, though, <clears throat> this there's actually a much, uh, <laughs> which is something that if you, it, it, so I'm, there, there's a there's a, a more um, uh, spiritual <laughs> point being made here, um, which is that it is not the dragons who are at fault, it is the bad karma that the rulers ha have themselves generated by their actions. Um, this is what's causing uh, unseasonal wind rain, drought, chill, heat, the ruining of the five grains, uh, all this stuff has caused. Don't blame the dragons. It's the rulers who have screwed up uh, by their, their bad actions. And this is another uh, similar um, uh, quote. Now, um, oh yeah, and here's, uh, let's see. This is the actual quote. I, when I saw this, this is not the fault of the dragons. I thought, I want to know what it really says in the sutra. And so this is the actual line um, that you can, if you use this, the information that's here, you get this. And if you know the Chinese word for dragon, uh, you can <laughs> track this down. Um, and this is, this is, it's four characters. This not dragon fault. <laughs> it's, it's pretty, it's pretty straightforward. It's uh, um, and, uh, and there's also a lot of other stuff about dragons um, in, in there as well. Let's see. Okay. Now, um, this is from one of the links um, that I showed earlier, and I just want to I want to read this. Um, this is nice, and then I want to go and and read a little bit of from the um, uh, from the uh, the the summary of the Sutra of the Ten Wheels. 
because uh, I think that that's important. And I and I do want, uh, please, in addition to reading this first chapter and the introduction, uh, do read. There's they're, they're fairly short articles um, that that summarize the sutra on the ten wheels. Um, it'll be very uh, helpful uh, for. Uh, actually knowing what it is that we're talking about when we talk about uh, the, the, this, the very first, one of the two first um, uh, texts that we know of, and that's another, well, that's another thing that needs to be emphasized. Um, this, is what, this is the earliest um, text in Chinese introducing Chittigarbha in Chinese Buddhism that we know of. That always needs to be kept in mind. Um, okay, but anyway, uh, here is somebody talking about um, uh, uh, this is not so much on the ten wheels. I'll get to that in a minute. But this is more talking about Chittigarbha in Chinese contemporary modern day Chinese Buddhism in general. Uh, generally speaking, for a beginner who has just started to enter Buddhism, we monks. This is written by a monk. Okay, we monks generally recommend that they read the Sutra of the Great Vows of Chittigarbha. Uh, why? Why is this? There are several reasons. The first reason is that the Kshidigarbha Sutra is a life-saving sutra in the age of the degenerate Dharma. So, you know, for, if if you have any memory of the, the Kshidigarbha Sutra, um, uh, if you've read it, uh, this is a major theme in the Kshidigarbha Sutra, the age of the degenerate Dharma. Um, anyway, uh, many sutras are in the three treasuries and the 12 divisions of Buddhism, but no one else is as straightforward as the Kshidigarbha Sutra or as suitable to fit the characters of our beings in the age of degenerate Dharma. This is the first point. Um, and so that's very clear. I mean, the, the Kshidigarbha Sutra really does emphasize, basically it emphasizes how bad we are, how bad uh, uh, we are and how bad of a time uh, we live in. Um, the second reason is that the Chittigarbha Bodhisattva has the most predestined relationship with our beings of samsara. Why is that? Uh, this is a little vague, but that, that's also something that's really strongly emphasized in the Chittigarbha Sutra, that actually Chittigarbha, Dizong, Jijang Bosal, does have a special relationship um, with us people in Jambudvipa, um, the, the place that we are living in. Um, such a predestined. This is the second one. The third and most important point, because the Kshidigarbha method is relatively easy to practice. <laughs> That's an important point. Um, okay. And then, uh, oh, this is uh, this is another quote from the same article on how to practice the Kshidigarbha method. Um, the reason why I wanted to put this quote in here is because uh, Jiru Ng makes, refers to this doesn't refer to this article, just refers to a, a phenomenon in among modern Chinese Buddhists um, on page, where, where do I say? Page 13. Let's go to page 13 here. Oh, that's 12, 13. And, okay, here's, here's the quote. Despite his evident popularity, this is Dizong. He is rarely enshrined in household altars, and lay Buddhists are hesitant when it comes to reciting the scripture on the past vows in their homes. It is feared his presence might invite into the household malignant forces causing illness, mishap, death, and ghost possession. <laughs> okay, and who wants that, right? Um, but uh, so. It, it, Ji Ring makes makes a point of this in in especially in the in in the introduction that one of the things that she wants to accomplish with her book is to kind of correct this misperception among contemporary Buddhists um, who overemphasize or place the wrong kind of emphasis on uh, Di Zong's relationship with the underworld, and this is another example of that here. Um, uh, this is the same person who is talking above. It says someone once told me that July. This is lunar July, which we're not in yet. We're still in lunar. We're still in the sixth lunar month. Um, it will be um, lunar July soon. So if you just Google Chinese lunar calendar, you can see when it will be. But it's coming up. Ghost month. Someone once told me that July was the ghost month. People should not practice Kshidigarbha method, should not recite the Kshidigarbha Sutta, should not do the Kshidigarbha repentance ritual, and should not chant the holy name of Kshidigarbha Bodhisattva. They told me that reciting the Kshidigarbha Sutra was not auspicious. 
doing the Bodhisattva repentance could, would easily attract sentient beings in the ghost realm. And chanting the holy name would make foes and karmic creditors appear earlier. Um, so this is just a, 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 another example of uh, the misperceptions that people have about uh, Dizong just because of, of Dizong's association with hell realms, you know, and if you read the Kshiti Garba Sutra, um, there's a lot of um, <laughs> scary stuff in it, as a matter of fact. Okay, um, let's see what else we got. All right, so this is this is actually the last slide that I have, which is uh, uh, very appropriately titled Things I Don't Want to Forget. Um, but the very first thing that I have listed here is the summary of the 10 wheels. Okay, I did, I did mention that I think the Juring overemphasizes a little bit the political dimension of uh, the teachings in the in the in the, the um, sutra on the ten wheels. And actually, I'm going to point that out when we look at the summary. Um, oh, but one thing I do want to look at is uh, yeah, this right here. Should be able to open up a web browser. Let's see. This is um, the stonesutras.org. One of the cool things that you can do on the website stonesutras.org is you can enter in characters, Chinese characters, and then it will show you all the instances that they have in their database of where that character has been carved into uh, rock and the different the different forms that it takes. Um, and it's actually kind of cool. And I'm, uh, okay, I'll, I'll come back to that. I do want to look at the summaries first. Um, okay. Oh yeah. Oh. This is this is kind of cool. There is actually a reference to a line that is in our Jijang Bosal chant on page five of Zhu Ying's book. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry. Where am I now? What page is this? Three? Almost there. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, here. Uh, teacher of the desolate darkness. That's her. That's her translation. Um, this is the second. This is from the second line of our. Um, <clears throat> we chant this as um, Namu. Uh, I've got the chant right here. Fortunately, I think. Oh yeah. Or did I? No, I didn't. Anyway, this is. Oh. Anyway, this is this from the second line. If you look at the um, the video, um, look at the characters in the video, you'll see that this is right out of the second line. This is from what um, Zhuri Ying refers to as some uh, the hymn to Dizong. Um, so the, uh, the this is a, a a contemporary Chinese Buddhist uh, practice of praying to uh, Dizong, and um, it has at least in part the same wording that we have in our in our Jijang Bosal chant from Korea. All right. Uh, okay, that's all good. Let me, so if you just click on this, it will bring up the Sutra of the Ten Wheels of Earth Store Bodhisattva, this online article. And this is from the um, this is an, an endorsement, you know, I, I actually kind of like this um, uh, uh, article uh, as uh, this, this, the article I just clicked on goes up through, uh, what does it say here? Oh, it doesn't say wheels one through four. And then this, and the, the follow on article goes through the wheels uh, well, uh, five through 10. Let me see. But uh, this is, this is uh, what, are the, what are the 10 wheels, right? Is bigger. See, what are the ten wheels? Indeed, they are ten deeds: three from the body, four from the mouth, and three from the mind. The good we do are the ten wholesome deeds. The evil we do are the ten unwholesome deeds. So now, this is a very standard, uh, a traditional Buddhist teaching: the ten uh, good deeds and the ten unwholesome deeds. Um, uh, but in the Sutra on the Ten Wheels, these are given a very specific um, uh, shape. All right, so uh, here, 
the Buddha spoke the first wheel by using the analogy of a king. Okay, so for each of the wheels, there are two analogies that are given in the sutra. One is the analogy of a king, an example of a situation in a kingdom and what a ruler should do. But the second analogy is always the analogy of a Buddha and, and what the Buddha does. Okay, so the, the, the political part of it is, is only being used as an illustration. So, for example, suppose in a kingdom, the king died. A kingdom without a king to lead is like a group of dragons. Oh, more dragons. Without, it's like a group of dragons without a leader. Society plunged into chaos. When in disorder, people started to do bad things, contended fight, slander, and ruin. cold nature. Everything is not going well, blah, blah, blah. The, the wise ministers quickly went about searching for the right one among the princes to ascend to the throne. The prince must possess, you know, all good qualities, when they find the right prince, then they had him ascend to the throne to start handling the state matters. This is what is called the first wheel of the king, that of a king's leadership. The first wheel of the Buddha, likewise in a land without a Buddha, people start to commit the 10 unwholesome deeds. As a result, society falls into disorder and people's minds are greatly distressed. Therefore, a great bodhisattva in one of the eight stages of a Buddha's life will descend to the human realm to teach living beings. Um, this is the first wheel analogy of a Buddha's leadership. This is the wheel to establish the Dharma, to teach and transform living beings. This is what's called the first wheel of the Buddha. So, yeah, uh, let's see. The second one there, let's see. I, I, I like the, uh, oh yeah, fourth. Right. Oh, yeah. Okay. So it goes through four. And then I'm going to um, look at. Oops. Okay. If you're in PowerPoint and the PowerPoint has a link in it, you press, you hold down the control button and you click on it, and then the page opens. All right. So now we're to the fifth wheel. Um, how are we doing on time? Okay. All right. So I'm just going to leave that for people to read. I do want to look at Stone Sutra. And, and really, I, I do recommend that you read that. So um, even though the uh, I, f I found that the actual, <laughs> sometimes it can be kind of a little disappointing when you actually find a sutra or a summary of a sutra that the, you have been looking for. Um, the Each of the 10 wheels, there's a lot of repetition. Um, it's uh, uh, not, uh, well, yeah, I, I'll let people read it and make what they make what they will of it and we'll discuss it uh, when we meet again in two weeks but now I want to look at um, what it looks like to um, look up so you go to stone sutras.org and then you click on characters and then they have a list of characters that you can you can just select one of these but you can enter any character you want to and so let's just take um, here's an, here's a nice character. This is the character for middle. So, so, uh, this right here, this is middle country, Buddha teaching stone sutra, Chinese Buddhist stone. So the word for Buddhist in Chinese is Buddha teaching. All right. So now we're going to take the character for Jung or middle or in the midst of and search for it here just enter it there and oh yeah so then it first gives the results as oh you mean this character here and you just click on it again and then it will show you um oh so here's a mistake this is not jung this is um the character for above um but these are different um uh 
these all look pretty much the same. Nothing too. Uh, let's try. I'm going to try Buddha. And there are 120 examples of Buddha. And there's a little more variability in these. But at the same time, these are all pretty recognizable. Um, and uh, yeah, these are all pretty recognizable, which is good. A lot of times when you see calligraphy, uh, calligraphy often tends to be more individual, more stylized. Uh, I guess when people are carving things into stone, they want to make sure everybody can actually read it. Because <laughs> that's what we're looking at here, things that are carved into stone. Anyway, so. Um, we will continue to talk about the first chapter uh, when we meet again in two weeks. And I really uh, strongly encourage people to, to read those summaries, that summary uh, of the... Um, uh, oh yeah, read the summary of the of the um, ten wheels, and then also. Not only was there the summary, but there was also. Oops. All right, so this is on slide two thirty one. Uh, the, the first bullet point or arrow point is the uh, summary of the um, of the wheels. the The second bullet point is another two online talks that both focus on um, how the Sutra on the Ten Wheels is specifically addresses uh, meditation. Um, and uh, th this is actually important enough that down here, when, when uh, one person went to the extent of writing the uh, entire Sutra on a cave wall in, in a Chinese cave temple, um, but when they did that, they, they wrote the shorter version of the Sutra on the Ten Wheels. But someone else wanted to, wanted to write the longer version of the Sutra on the Ten Wheels on a cave wall. And they only wrote the excerpt on meditation. So this part, this part of the Sutra on the Ten Wheels that deals with meditation is considered to be, at least by people who are writing things on cave walls uh, in medieval China, considered to be uh, important. So I would... Um, encourage you to read that. Do we have any um, questions before we recite the four vows together to end? Okay, well, um, then I will try to find the four vows here somewhere. The morning bell chant? No? Okay, let me just... Uh, here it is. So um, thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, we can unmute and say goodbye after we recite the four vows together. Um, the first, uh, sentient beings are numberless. We vow to save them all. Delusions are endless. We vow to cut through them all. The teachings are infinite. We vow to learn them all. The Buddha way is inconceivable. We vow to attain it. May whatever excellent qualities we have gained from this practice be extended for the benefit of all beings. Thanks. It's been great to see you. And you. I'll see you again in two weeks, if not sooner. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks.